Does your life ever feel like it just goes around and around in a circle? Does your life feel that way? Does your week ever feel that way? Does your month ever feel that way? Maybe the last decade has felt that way. You're just kind of going around doing the same thing over and over again, going around in a circle. Maybe you remember about three months ago, there was a news story out of Carmel, Indiana, about a man who sought to set a Guinness World Record. And so what did he do? He got into a stick ship convertible one day, and he drove around one of those infamous Carmel roundabouts 500 times. He drove nonstop in circles for three hours, 500 laps, and in so doing, or in sands of Carmel, Indiana, set a Guinness Book of World Records records for the longest time driving around in a roundabout circle. You know, I think that there's a lot better ways to probably spend three hours of your time, but I think the man had a mission, and he accomplished it. Just keep going around in a circle. But maybe that could be an image, a picture of what it often feels like to live life in this world, doesn't it? We sometimes feel like there's, there's no end in sight. There's no point to our journey. We just keep doing the same things over and over and, and over and over again. The promise of God that breaks into our life that feels as if it's just going around in circles all the time is that there is a purpose for your life, that there is an end in sight, that there is a goal that we strive for, and that is eternity in the presence of Jesus Christ. And we know that the end of all things, the end to this broken, going in circles kind of world is the coming of Jesus when he will make all things new on the day of his final coming when he is coming soon. And so that's what Revelation is preparing our hearts for. It's helping us to live with, with hope that is holding on to God's promises every day as we look forward in faith to what God will do at the end of all things in the coming of Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 14, the Bible says the second woe has passed, the third woe is coming soon. And so that invites us to remember what are these three woes that John is speaking about here as Jesus reveals as he reveals himself to john and john then passes that on to christian churches two thousand years ago and now also to us in the present day well the first of the woes of the three is best understood as the demonic forces attacking the human race and revelation chapter 9 vividly john by the spirit of god describes what will happen in the end times which we are in the end times, we understand, is the times ranging from Jesus' ascension to God the Father's right hand until the day of his final coming. So that whole span of time, the amount of years known only to God, is the end times. And in those end times, the forces of this dark world, under the authority of the devil, will attack the human race, will tempt people, will lead people astray will try to get people to fall away from God to deny Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus himself said in John chapter 10, verse 10? He said, the thief, and here he's describing the devil, he said, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. And so the mission of the devil is to destroy lives. But Jesus says, but I have come, John 10, verse 10, that they may have life and have it to the full. And so the demonic forces attack but in Jesus, we find refuge and we find our life. That's what the first woe is all about. The second woe in Revelation, the latter, the latter part of chapter 9, is that there will be a last battle that is waged. Later chapters of Revelation that we'll get to soon, we'll talk about that final big battle. Maybe you've heard of Armageddon before. And so the big battle between the, the dark side, the dark forces, and those who are with the Lord and we know that it will seem at many times in that battle that the evil one is winning. But we know that Jesus wins and that victory is found in Jesus Christ who has defeated Satan, that he is a real enemy of each of our lives, but he is a defeated enemy conquered by Jesus' death upon the cross and his resurrection from the grave. So the second woe speaks of that final battle. But the third woe, which we'll get in today, speaks of the present world itself, the roundabout, going in circles world in which we live, a broken, fallen creation, will itself come to an end. This sinful world will come to an end that when Jesus comes again in glory, he will make all things new in his new creation, in the glories of paradise. But this world, as we know it, has an end in sight. 
and there is a brighter day, a better day, in the presence of Jesus in his kingdom of glory. So the second woe is past, the third woe is coming soon. Let's hear about the third woe. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. So if you remember, there have been six angels already that have sounded their trumpets, bringing about God's judgment upon creation. But now the picture comes in a very apocalyptic way, a very picturesque way of the seventh of those seven angels. He sounds his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Maybe you, like me, enjoy Handel's Messiah. And you can hear the inspiration of Handel as that chorus rings out, and he shall reign forever and ever, and he shall reign and he shall reign and he shall reign forever. You see, that's the song of the voices in heaven. That's the angel song saying of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, that he has a kingdom that will endure far past any kingdom or government of this world, and he will reign forever and ever. There is no end to the kingdom of God. So if we want to better understand the kingdom of God, it's helpful to understand it this way. That is where Jesus reigns. Jesus is the king. He is reigning. He's ruling. But he reigns in, in three distinct ways. He reigns over the whole universe. He reigns over his church on earth. And then we look forward to him reigning, as he does right now, over the saints and angels in heaven. And so the, the Reformation movement described that in three different ways. So for 500 years at least, and then even more some, the Christian church has understood God's kingdom as the kingdom of power, the kingdom of grace, and the kingdom of glory. So Jesus Christ is the ruler over it all, right? He is large and he's in charge. He shall reign forever and ever. So he's the ruler of the kingdom of power. So think about everything that fills the earth, everything that fills the universe. It is all under the authority of Jesus. So every planet, every star, the sun, the moon, every living creature on the ground, in the sky, in the water, Every single human being, regardless of whether they believe in Jesus or not, are somehow under the authority of Jesus Christ. We are dependent upon the blessing that comes from God. You know, the Bible says that the rain falls both on the righteous and on the unrighteous. That is, good things happen to both people that are bad and people that are good. That, that bad things happen to both people that are Christian and those who are not Christian. And so in the kingdom of power, God reigns and God blesses his creation. He sustains creation. If God were to pull back from creation, it would be a complete mess. But God keeps his hand in creation, sustaining it. That's called the kingdom of power, God's rule over the whole universe. But specifically, God's kingdom of grace is what you and I experience when we are baptized into Jesus as Addison was this morning, that when we become the children of God, we enter into his reign of grace. So God in his grace, his free love, his unconditional mercy for sinful human beings invites you and me to become the children of God, that the gospel of Jesus Christ rings out that Christ died and rose again for sinful people, that they through faith in him might believe and live forever. And so that gospel call rings out, and those who trust in Jesus, those who repent of sin, those who believe in Christ, become members of the kingdom of grace. And so that's what the church is, the church that is throughout the world, both those who have died and already gone into heaven, and those who are present now, and those who will become Christian in the future, are part of God's kingdom of grace, underneath the authority and the love of Jesus, and recipients of his forgiveness because they trust in him. And so what happens right now in the kingdom of grace within his church, where God gives us his word, he gives us his sacraments, it's preparing us for what will happen in the kingdom of glory. So again, as I mentioned to the kids, we are people of hope. And so holding on to God's promises every day with eyes pointed forward, we look forward and we are prepared right now by faith 
for what we will one day receive by sight, and that is to experience the joys of heaven, where all pain and sadness and grief and loss will be gone forever, and we will experience the glory that the saints and the angels in heaven know right now. So God's kingdom of power, His kingdom of grace, and His kingdom of glory. At the church I grew up in over in southern Illinois, they had a tradition that when a Christian died, that at the funeral service, they would print out a bulletin and it would have the person's name, and then at three different dates. At one date, entered into God's kingdom of power. That was the day they were born. Another date, entered into God's kingdom of grace, the day they're baptized. And then the third date, the day they died to this life and awoke in the kingdom of heaven, they entered into God's kingdom of glory. So what would those days be for you? Obviously, we know the day in which we were born. We, we celebrate that, or sometimes later in life we deny that every year. And then we know the kingdom of grace is when we are baptized into Christ. You may or may not know the day. Most people at least know the time frame in which it was. So I would say for myself, June 21st, 1979, entered into God's kingdom of power. July 8th, 1979, entered into God's kingdom of grace and then entered into God's kingdom of glory. We don't know yet, right? We don't know. Whenever God says, the Lord alone knows that day or the hour, but we know that we will be under his kingdom forever. So again, Jesus is reigning over all of this kingdom. And I love what Isaiah chapter 9 says in description of this reign of Jesus Christ. We hear this verse at Christmas time. It says, for to us, a child is born. So an unlikely leader of this kingdom. To us, a son is given. And the government, that is the kingdom, will be on his shoulders. The airwaves and, and the television screen is filled with people competing to have their party and their shoulders be the one on whom the government is placed. So they want to convince you that they deserve your vote. Well, through it all, Jesus says that he's the one who ultimately carries on his shoulders all of the authority of the world. And he will be called, what will we say in response to what he does? We'll call him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government, that is his kingdom, and the greatness of his peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne. He will reign over David's kingdom, establishing and upholding the kingdom with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Why will Jesus be able to reign and his peace endure forever? Because his reign is one of grace and forgiveness of sins. That he doesn't reign with power and authority like the rest of the world sees power and authority, but he humbles himself to deliver the goods of forgiveness of sins to all who would trust in him, no matter what earthly government they are under no matter what political party they belong to, no matter what language they speak, when sinners come to Jesus, they experience His reign, His government, and His peace that knows no end. You see what heaven is doing? They're singing the praises of this King. They're singing the praises of this King. And so when we sing the praises of this King as we come together, that prepares us for what we will do in heaven. And also, Revelation says that in response to what the angels sing, he will reign forever and ever. The church echoes their praise. Verse 16 introduces us yet again to the 24 elders. Remember, these are the guys with, with crowns that they lay down before the throne of God. The 12 representing the 12 tribes in the Old Testament. 12 representing the 12 apostles in the New Testament era. And together, the whole people of God represented in a picturesque way by the 24 elders. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces. What humility in the presence of Jesus. And they worshiped God saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. 
So all of God's children, again, with eyes focused upon the end, not going around and around in circles, say the day is coming when Jesus will judge the dead. We say that in the creed every Sunday. He will judge both the living and the dead. On the last day, he will raise up the living and the dead, and all people will stand before his throne. And those who cling to Jesus by faith and say, I am with you, Jesus. My righteousness is yours. My holiness is yours. My forgiveness comes from you. They will enter into his glory. But those who have said, no, Jesus, I don't want you. I don't want you in my life. And they've worked against his kingdom. They've walked destroying the earth, trying to destroy God's reign. But they can't do it. What happens? They will be banished from his presence forever. So the worship of the 24 elders, as pictured here, is a, is a picture, it's a painting for us of what it looks like when you and I, with all of God's children in the past, the present, and even into the future, celebrate the victory of Jesus, crushing the enemy by his resurrection. And as we celebrate his victory, we lay all of what is ours down before him, we pray as we do today and as we do every Sunday, thy kingdom come. So remember, Jesus' kingdom extends over all of the universe, but we pray in that petition, thy kingdom come, that God's kingdom would dwell in us too. God's reign doesn't depend upon what we do or what we say, but when we pray, thy kingdom come, we say, God, you reign over the whole universe, reign over my life. God, you reign over the heavens, Reign in my heart. God, you rule with great power and authority. Be the one that speaks with authority into my decision-making, into my priorities, into how I, I live my life, how I go to work, how I, how I parent my children, how I live in life with my spouse. God, be the ruler, be the king of my life, and rule it all by your forgiveness and your grace. Thy kingdom come. And that kingdom of God that will come even without our prayer but that will come among us when we call for Jesus to come is described this way in 1 Thessalonians. The coming of Jesus is described by the Apostle Paul this way. It says, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, a day known only to the Father. He's revealed from heaven in blazing fire with His powerful angels. And what will He do? He will punish those who do not obey, who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction. They will be shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. We don't want that to happen to anybody. But notice that that destruction, that banishing, that punishment comes to those who hear the good news of Jesus. They say, uh-uh, I don't want it. They reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so God says, your will be done. So they've said no to Jesus. God says, your will be done. There will be no Jesus for you in eternity. But verse 10, for those who say, God, thy will be done on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who believed. And this includes you. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. So how are we spared from the wrath that comes upon God's creation? How are we spared from this going around in circles with no point? It's to believe in Jesus Christ, to trust in Jesus Christ, to receive Jesus Christ, and to know that the one who reigns over the kingdom of power, of grace, and of glory also desires to reign in our hearts and lives as well. That we bow before him because he reigns forever and ever. John finishes up this vision in Revelation 11 with these words in verse 19. He says, and then God's temple in heaven was opened. So the church doors were opened. All of God's people got to see God in His temple for with their own eyes. And within His temple was seen the Ark of His Covenant, which in the Old Testament, only on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, only could the high priest go in and see that ancient Ark of the Covenant. But now all of God's glory is available to anyone who would believe in Jesus. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. There came... As Jesus comes again, there came what every insurance agent would say are so many acts of God that it's an insurance agency nightmare. That everything is shaken. Everything is disrupted. Everything that is filled with sin is destroyed. But where is the hope? The hope is found in Jesus. 
And so whenever God sends the warning of those earthquakes, the signs and heaven above and the earth below or in the sea, as many places in Revelation point out and throughout the Bible, when God shakes the earth, he's seeking to shake people's lives. And he says, I am up to something. And whenever he shakes us, it's a shake of grace to say it's time to wake up and it's time to turn to Jesus. So as we wake up, and as the first and the second and the third woes are announced, we turn to Jesus. And in him we find our hope that the God who has given his promises that we hold on to every day is faithful and he gives life in his kingdom. And he shall reign forever and ever. Amen.